Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number 41. The purpose of life is the life of purpose. Robin Schrama. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. So guys, today on the show, we have Chris Vogler, who is the writer of The Writer's Journey, which breaks down Joseph Campbell's hero's journey for filmmakers and screenwriters. And I wanted to take an excerpt from his amazing course that he did with Michael Haig called The Screenwriting Blueprint, The Hero's Two Journeys. And Chris, in this uh, this clip that I'm, I'm sharing with you guys, goes through the breakdown of the ordinary world versus the special world in the hero's journey. And it's, an, it's kind of a part of the hero's journey that is not discussed in detail very much out in, in the world. So I wanted to kind of bring this to you guys, give you guys a, a little bit of a taste of the kind of killer information that's in this course. And it has over... I think 4,000 students and is one of the best-selling screenwriting uh, courses on Udemy. And of course, because you guys are part of the tribe, I will give you a special discount code at the end of the episode. So sit back, take some notes, and enjoy. Now, I got my terminology mostly from Campbell. I've adapted it a little bit, and I've edited here and there because he wasn't talking about movies. He was talking about myths and legends fairy tales and folklore, and they're similar, but they do have their distinctions. And I I urge all of you to think this way. As you listen to these ideas and anyone's ideas about writing, I I think you find there's, oh, there's a useful idea, and that's, that's right, I agree with that, and that, oh, I never thought of that before. But at some point, I think you make up your own, and you, you create your own lingo and your own uh, shared language with the people that you work with, uh, and I think that's what you must do here: is absorb it and you know take notes or pull out a piece here and there that sounds right to your observation of the world. This is all about how you perceive things as an artist, so you've got to make it your own. And that's why Campbell called his book "The Hero with a Thousand Faces," not "The Hero with One Face." He could have said that because, in a way, it's true. There is one general human story that keeps being told over and over, but he said, no, it's a thousand faces because it shifts with the point of view of each person and especially each culture. So cultures have some distinctions here. Now, the four movements uh, Campbell gave names to, and I have stuck by those by and large, Uh, the opening movement uh, he just called separation. Separation, because that is the act or the action that is happening in that first act. There is a lot of wordplay in this system, uh, in this way of looking at things, and uh, I find often you have to look at the words and their origins or understand two or three meanings for them to really get 
the full package. When we say an act in a script or a play, we mean a division of time, uh, but we also can mean an action that's being performed. And what's the action of the first quarter of most stories? It is to separate from something, from that ordinary world. So think about your own stories as we go through this and see, does this apply? Does this make sense? Uh, it's no problem if, if it doesn't because we're flexible here. But uh, I think this is what you must do, is try to plug it into your own, your own stories. But I find most stories have this, uh, this general action going on for the first, say, 20, 25 minutes. It's all about pulling up your roots and breaking the apron strings and getting out of uh, one environment and into another, sometimes with difficulty uh, and sometimes with great eagerness. I mean, for example, in The Firm, uh, the character is uh, separating from that old world, and in fact, he's uh, running from it, you know, running from the fact that his mom is in a trailer park and that he has an unacceptable brother, and he doesn't want uh, to face any of that, so he's running headlong into this. That's one condition. Other heroes are still clinging to their ordinary world and have to be yanked out of it. But the act of separation is the key verb there. The second movement takes you across this line that separates the two worlds. So you're entering this new world, and Campbell says most likely what's going to happen is some evocation of the feeling of descent. That's the act, is to descend now, there are many ways to uh, describe this, and I, I would point out to you that my way of looking at things is poetic. I'm all about metaphors, because Campbell said that's what a story or a myth really is. It's a metaphor. So when I say something like descent, it may be, well, they're not descending in my story. They're actually climbing at that point. You know, don't be so literal about it. Don't get hung up on the specific verse. Think about the intention behind them, the idea of leaving something and taking a plunge, in a figurative sense, into some new world. Uh, we talk, for example, about falling in love. And in a love story, you will maybe separate from a former love or from some condition where you can't love or be loved, and then you begin to, and it has that feeling, even in the language of Falling, falling in love. Now that takes you around to roughly uh, the halfway point, Michael's 50%, or what Sid Field calls the midpoint. Very important moment in my way of looking at things because it gives punctuation to the story. It gives a signal to the audience that a section is done. The work of one part is done. Now, something really big usually happens in the, roughly the middle of the story. It may be delayed to maybe 75%, but some major event has to be confronted here. And that has usually a characteristic of death and rebirth. Now, this is the key of my whole approach and Campbell's whole idea, is that all the myths and legends are replaying some kind of symbolic scene for us that represents the mystery of death and rebirth, that in order to uh, go through the stages of life, the, the idea is uh, that to live fully and to fully express yourself and fully experience these various stages we all go through, the old life has to die. You could say the ego has to die time and again. You know, and this isn't just a one-time thing in your life. It happens over and over. So uh, there is that sense in all literature and art of uh, representing this tableau of death and rebirth. And the ancient myths, the Greek drama, all of the art from the ancient world uh, is somehow expressing this idea of death and rebirth. In the actual legends themselves, the myths, the heroes often go into some cave and fight a dragon, or they go into the underworld and face death, or they actually die and somehow by a miracle are brought back to life. And we see this in religions around the world, and it's a very, very common and well-understood thing. And it seems to work at all levels, even down to jokes and uh, comic books and uh, the, the most silly sitcom or kids' uh, animation show. 
they all somehow touch a corner of this idea of death and rebirth. So you're descending towards that death. And then the next movement, the third part of the circle, third quadrant of the circle, is what Campbell calls initiation. And it's a little strange to have an initiation three-quarters of the way through the story because initiation doesn't it mean beginning, a new beginning. What is meant here is that, yes, you are beginning again with this new life. You've, the old life has died in the first half of the story. Now you have survived this ordeal of death and uh, some part of you has died or you've dealt with death somehow, and now you are initiated into the new life. This is the beginning of that rebirth process. And there are many ups and downs that can happen here. Uh, Sometimes you have love scenes as people earn the right to be loved by shedding and sacrificing the old ways. You may also have... Uh, problems like ego inflation because, hey, we've faced death and we've conquered the devil and we've stood up to the forces of darkness, so aren't we as powerful as they are? You know, and this is what happens sometimes in war stories or in uh, police dramas where the hero sort of gets slimed by the struggle with the opposition and they take on some of the qualities of the enemy. So there are possible pitfalls here, but the main idea is one of just getting your bearings and experimenting again with the idea of of this new life. Now, the final movement, the last quadrant, Campbell calls return because in most stories, there is a sense of closing the cycle and coming back around to a beginning point. Uh, Sometimes it's very literal and geographic and architectural. You go back to the same building or the same room or the same uh, town, and revisited that place having changed. You see it differently now. Your attitude and your performance is different because of what you've been through. Uh, But there are some special cases that I should mention. Uh, One thing is to, to keep in mind, and I think we have some examples that touch on this that we'll be discussing today, but there is a mode, the tragic mode, where the hero makes a mistake. Either early on, they are in denial about something. Uh, as in the case of Notorious, uh, there's denial of love, uh, of the evident fact of love staring them in the face. They're two movie stars, after all. Uh, can't they see that they're meant for each other? So they're, but there's denial about that, so the whole movie is tending to disaster, but it's rescued just at the last moment. Uh, and then there's another tragic case where the hero... Uh, may do everything right, but then blow it at the end by sliding back to old behavior or denying you know, the wonder of everything that he's learned so far. Uh, so the tragic case is one sort of subset of this where they may not return or they may not complete the thing, and that's the tragedy, is that they failed. The other interesting exception is something you find in foreign films, in Australian movies, in movies from Asia sometimes, uh, French films like to do this, and student films like to do this, they don't have this conventional closed structure. This is the the closed structure I'm describing is the fairy tale form, and Hollywood movies are a lot like fairy tales. They have the same sort of parental attitude of putting you to bed after scaring you a little bit with a story, they put you to bed reassured that, you know, all your cultural values are just the same, and so we return, and nothing really has changed. Um, but there is this other pattern where instead of returning and closing the circle, it's open, open-ended. And the story may loop off into uh, some infinite uh, direction or new turn. Uh, it may hook into another story if there's going to be a sequel So you complete part of the journey, but leave some things open, like the villain gets away, as in Star Wars, uh, at the first Star Wars movie. I mean, we killed the Death Star, and we rescued the princess, but Darth Vader spun away, and we know he's going to come back someday. And there's also a wink between uh, uh, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia, so we know something is going to go on between them later. Incest, if I'm reading it right, but uh, that's... That's left uh, to be discovered. 
So this open-ended possibility is there. Uh, I, I think it's creeping into American movies a little bit, uh, a more awareness or acceptance of this, where you don't resolve every question and you leave some mysteries and question marks. And again, this is about punctuation. Most American movies end with very emphatic punctuation, uh, an exclamation point. We won! Hooray for us! Hooray for our side! You know, Top Gun is like this. Yay, we killed some Russians that have families at home. And wow, aren't we great? We killed those Russian flyers. So, um, you know, we end most of our American films this way or with a period that uh, it's definitely over. That's the end. That's all. But there is this other possibility that things can go off into the ellipsis of dot, dot, dot of, well, then who knows what happened? You know, and the attitude is a little more mature and less parental. And the idea is, uh, I'm not God here as the filmmaker. I'm a participant in the art just like you are. So let's all together figure out how this ends. You go home and keep talking about it. So there's a sense that the story goes on in the creative discussion that's been stirred up. Or it may end with a question mark of, did they? Did they get together? Did they make love? Were they meant for each other? Is it a happy ending or not? And in this open-ended form, uh, often they will end with, with this uh, hook of a question mark. I think it's interesting just even the shapes of these things. The question mark is uh, shaped like a hook, and the questions are very important in both the inner and outer journey of setting up at the beginning some problem or question. Will he achieve that outer goal, and will he or she overcome this inner thing that we're going to talk about later? Understanding the hero's journey is is like basically 101, screenwriting 101. You have to understand that concept. You have to understand that whole process. And Chris is the leading expert in the in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. If you want to know more about uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, uh, the writer's journey by Chris Folger, or about the course, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS041. And as promised, the discount code is I-F-H-D-I-S. That's I-F-H-D-I-S. Do it into the checkout. It normally retails for 175 bucks, but I'm giving it to you guys for 15 bucks. So it is, if you're a writer or a filmmaker and want to understand more about the hero's journey, definitely check it out, guys. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really, really helps us out a lot. I truly appreciate it. And that's it for another episode of the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. Thank you guys so, so much. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y.com.